Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is Tuesday, the 9th of October, 2012, and our guest is Blake Bowles. Blake is the author of Better Than College, How to Build a Successful Life Without a Four-Year Degree. Welcome, Blake. Thanks, Steve. Glad to be here. Really appreciate you being here. Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project, thanks to Mighty Bell and Blackboard Collaborate. I am on my Hack Your Education tour, hackyoureducation.com, uh, convening discussions about education in local communities. It's a lot of fun. If you're interested, go to hackyoureducation.com. The Learning 2.0 conference was in August, and the Library 2.012 conference just concluded last week. These were worldwide virtual conferences. All the content is free. Just an amazing set of presentations from both conference, and those recordings are all up. Uh, you're going to love them. Coming up is the Global Education Conference. That's November 12th through the 17th. That is five days, 24 hours a day, worldwide. If you are interested in presenting, there's still time to submit a presentation. The conference focuses on participation. So we sure hope if you have something to say about globally connecting students and teachers that you'll consider submitting. Coming up on the Future of Education next week, Denise Pope from Stanford comes back on to talk about uh, her project, Challenge Success. On the 17th, Kirsten Olson talks about her book, Wounded by School. Uh, should be a lot of fun. Susie Boss, on her new book, Bringing Innovation to School, is on October 23rd. Jamie McMillan on Legendary Learning, the famous homeschooler's guide to self-directed excellence, is on the 25th. Cal Newport comes back on the 30th to talk about his new book. Lots, lots more coming up and more that's not on the schedule. Hopefully something that you'll find interesting. If you've missed any of our sessions, please note they are all recorded at futureofeducation.com in full Blackboard Collaborate form and in MP3 audio. Uh, we talked to Tom Van Der Ark last week about his book, Getting Smart. I'm particularly proud of that interview because I really disagree with a lot of what Tom says, and I think it was a great example of a very civil and thoughtful dialogue around educational issues where we didn't see eye to eye. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping some people will listen to it and, and let me know how they feel about it. Before that, we had the MOOC panel, the true history of the MOOC, which was a lot of fun. Uh, Ron Richard before that, and Nick, Nicole Goyal on his book, uh, One Size Does Not Fit All. Anyway, lots more, hopefully something of value to you. Over 300 shows at this point. So this is when you can let us know where you're participating from. Look for the star to the left of the map. It's the second icon down. Click on it twice, and then click on the map. Maybe give us a report of the time and temperature. I know we saw Australia in the chat earlier. So far, we're looking North America-centric. There's Australia. Oh, Anna, Indonesia. Lovely to have you here. Students are getting extra credit to join this webinar. How fun. Thanks for doing that, Professor Greenbaum. Dominican Republic. Terrific. Well, wherever you're listening from or if you're listening to the recording, we're sure glad to have you here. Thanks to Mighty Bell. Uh, they do support me in a lot of ways. Uh, um, Gina Bianchini is the head of Mighty Bell, and she was the creator of Ning. I've created a Mighty Bell space for this event. I've tried to put up every link, I, good link I could find for Blake in the Mighty Bell. It's a content curation and conversation web service. I think you'll really like it. There's the link in the chat. Um, and you can, you'll can you see the different links from Blake's work and um, his books there and you can make comments, be part of a conversation. So Blake, this was a really fun book for me to read. Uh, I've, got to, I've got to believe it was fun for you to write, given kind of your philosophy of life. 
Um, how long did it take, and you know, how have you felt about the process? The book took about two years to write. Uh, I, there's definitely an aspect of me jumping on the bandwagon of criticizing college, but it wasn't too hard to do because of the skyrocketing tuition prices. And um, finished the book in June, and, and this was a book that I independently published. So I used a crowdfunding website, Indiegogo.com, which is the sort of unknown stepchild of Kickstarter, to raise about nine thousand dollars to publish the book. And so I own the book. I actually give the book away for free as a PDF to teenagers and college, stu college students on my website, and it's something I'm really proud of. Well, there's so much of your life that models the content of the book, um, and and certainly these aren't new messages. Um, you know, as you describe in the book, I mean, John Taylor Gatto's work of you know, on now what 30 years ago, uh, in a lot of cases, being so relevant. But there is something about this particular period of time that seems to be inviting a really good look at the value of college. Um, and, and, we're, and I think we'll drill, drill a little bit deeper than that as well. Uh, there's way more than an hour's worth of material that I want to talk about. Um, so uh, those of you who are listening, we're just going to give a taste of the book. Um, it, I do give it a really high recommendation. I really enjoyed reading it, uh, and hopefully you'll consider uh, purchasing it. And if you're a student, maybe emailing Blake. <laughs> uh, Blake, I had two experiences this week which were very interesting for me. Uh, and, I'm, and I wonder if they might not help start us off. The first was uh, I do a podcast with Audrey Waters, uh, who writes Hack Education, and her son, sort of for lack of any other options in his life after high school, decided to join the military. And the reaction I had to that was just sort of sadness that our school system doesn't produce the kind of uh, proactive sense of capability that would would open different doors than that. And certainly you tell so many stories in the book of ways in which you can kind of go out and, and apprentice to people. Um, is there just something sort of inherently, uh, you know, I want to say disenfranchising or um, ab about school that tends to block that, that uh, creative independence? Sure. I, I think it's pretty clear that you go through K through 12, and it's a lot of uh, spoon feeding type education, uh, and that's that's not exactly a, a creativity workout right there in terms of finding uh, alternative solutions for educating yourself. It does you know condition a lot of us to uh, rely upon teachers and classrooms to to learn. And as I saw from your guest list, you have a lot of people who you know who are doing a good job of challenging. That notion, that in regards to going into the military right after high school, you know, um, unless this was you know a seriously thought out decision, it, it seems to me like college and the military fulfill uh, can fulfill a similar role as a, a sort of rite of passage experience, and it's you know something bigger than yourself that you're thrown into, uh, sort of overwhelming challenge, and uh, creating a similar rite of passage experience for yourself without one of those big pre-made institutional answers is difficult. And uh, I don't you know, daydream of every person in the world doing what I suggest in the book. It's uh, the book, I wrote it to, to push those who are on the, the margin of deciding whether they really need college or not, uh, push them with, um, in the direction of self-directed learning and try to show that there are big, meaningful challenges that you can give yourself in situations you can throw yourself in, which can provide uh, as rich and as skill-building ex an experience as a four-year uh, college experience or perhaps even the military. You know, I feel like you're being a little bit generous, and, and I'll, so I'll push back a little on that, because I feel like part of the message of the book is that the choice to go to college or, say, the choice to go into the military without knowing his individual circumstances is kind of playing it safe, right? I mean, it's um, it's it's sort of the expected path and doesn't really require that you push past or push into understanding what you really want to be doing or how you want to be doing it. And I would imagine that's true for some good percentage of students. 
Yeah, certainly. And I think for a lot of us at, at age 17, the choice is, it seems very clear at the moment. It's either you go to college and be successful, or you don't go to college and maybe it's the military, or more likely, uh, maybe you, you know, we think we go into a trade school or we do community college and get an AA, and then at that point we are, we are not successful because, you know, as we know, the statistics say you make a lot more money if you have a four-year college degree, and better if you have a master's. And it's, that, that's the assumption. I, I agree. I'll, I'll push a little harder. It, it's, it's a very false assumption. So it was fun to see that somebody from the Dominican Republic here, I have two children who sort of play into the story. One was a son who you know, wasn't really enjoy, never really enjoyed school, didn't do very well in it. Um, you know, it was clearly a case for me of being frustrated with the, the school system, who decided to drop out of junior college and go to the Dominican Republic and be a surfer. He learned a lot of lessons, but that meant that his sister, who came a couple of years after him, when she said she wasn't sure she wanted to go to college right away, we really encouraged her to take a gap year and said, you know, the only thing we said was, we hope you'll find something really valuable to do so you look back and feel good about yourself. Ended up going to Nepal and um, spent six months working with a great humanitarian organization. Is now a freshman in college and, you know, quite the better for it. Um, but sort of in both cases, I feel like the, you know, good lessons for me as a parent about putting school into the right perspective. Can I tell you my second story real quick? Please. So um, th this um, uh, this week also I met a guy who's a freshman at, a, at another university and we were talking about what he's doing. He works in a peer counseling group at the school and he said we help students begin to understand what kinds of extracurricular activities they should be doing in order to get into graduate school. And I kind of bit my tongue, but I thought, you know, by the time you're in college, shouldn't you be doing extracurricular activities because you want to be doing them, not because they're the expected stepping stone to a next set of sort of compliance measures? Uh, that really kind of boggled my mind. Have, have you experienced that? Yeah, and I was I was part of that myself. I went to college. I went to UC Berkeley, and I remember right after graduating taking the GRE exam because I just had no idea what else to do and the the, the stepping stone of, of higher education the latter is um, it's I I think that's a lot of, of what we get trained to do in in college is to you know we're essentially being trained to be little college professors or maybe you know researchers if we're in the sciences but the number of available positions for college professors and researchers who actually require these graduate degrees is so, so much lower than the number of college students going through there. And I agree with you on the gap year thing, or even taking time off to go become a surf bum. Um, I think if we had as many college students in the States doing that as they do out in Europe, it would be, it would be a boon to the, um, just, just how higher education happens in this country. But that's not, that's not what we do. So it feels like there's a, a surfing pro. <laughs> he was a surfing bum, but that's okay. He, uh, there is a theme throughout the book for me that, uh, that what you really need to succeed in life, you are, and these are my words, not yours, so feel free to refute them, that what you really need to succeed in life, you're more likely to get outside of college than within. It was a appropriate for me to sort of feel that theme throughout the book? I think your audio is off. Thank you. I think you can do that both outside and inside college. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said for self-directed learning uh, within university. Again, you just need to get that idea implanted in your head that you, you can do it, that it can happen. I was lucky to um, have that idea I stumbled onto it halfway through my major in college, and I happened to be going to a college that was very friendly to a self-designed major program. But I remember considering at that moment when I discovered alternative education, I wanted to dive into it. Uh, if I wasn't able to do that, I certainly didn't want to stick with uh, the physics program I was with. And I was considering leaving college and going teaching snowboarding. It was uh, it was a lucky situation for me. So. I think more self-directed learning options within 
the college uh, environment is, is a good thing too. But I do focus in the book on doing it completely without college. And you also are pretty specific about just the dollar cost. So in addition to what you might do with that money that you would otherwise spend on college, you also look with a critical eye at the studies that would indicate that college graduates earn you know, X amount more than those who don't graduate from college. Do you want to explain that a little? Yeah, I'd like to, to say, first of all, that it's definitely true that on average you earn more money with a college degree, four-year degree, than not. But so many people quote that original $800,000 number that was a footnote on a college board paper and a Wall Street Journal article in 2010 revealed that they quickly rescinded that number and they said, oh, it's more like $450,000. I'm pretty sure the Georgetown study from this year also said roughly $450,000. But that Wall Street Journal article said if you take into account the most recent tuition hikes, uh, forsaken wages, and a number of other uh, basic factors, that it might be as, as low as $250,000. And so that's still nothing to be sniffed at. but you have to break that up among different colleges and different majors. And everyone wants to believe that they're on the, the top side of the average. And so it's easy to, uh, I think, be skewed in your, your dreams of how much money you'll be making with the college degree uh, when the people who are really pushing that average up are coming from the top tier schools and they're in uh, you know, finance or engineering. And if you are going to a middle-of-the-road school, like most people do, and you are majoring in something often in the liberal art that is not uh, a, one of those clear paths to, to lots and lots of money, then I think the whole idea of I, I will earn $800,000 more, even half a million dollars more in my lifetime, uh, just simply because I have a BA, that's, that's BS. <laughs> You've practiced that line. Um, okay, so um, that was an interesting perspective for me, and, and certainly it, it's individual to different circumstances and what the cost of the school is and sort of your, your particular motivation. But clearly you're trying to give people a sense of the, the options and to remove a little, perhaps, uh, the kind of trap in thinking that automatically requires that you assume, well, I need to go to college. Yeah, that's correct, because that's what it is. It's, it's a trap in thinking. The book is just out there to say there are some really good alternative paths and none of people are looking at them. I, I'm just about making informed decisions for going into college. Uh, we don't make informed decisions most, most of the time when we choose our K-12 through schools, and we don't make a big informed decision about whether to go to college or whether to do something else. It's, again, it's um, how to build a successful life with, without a degree. Success is just equated with at college. We've seen a couple of questions in the chat come up, and, and I'm not going to be able to get to every question at this point, but I will address two that I've seen so far. One is the fact that a lot of employment opportunities uh, use the degree as kind of a gatekeeping measure, uh, as a way of winnowing down the number of applicants. How do you recommend somebody who's gone out and developed the passion and done some interesting things how do you recommend that they approach a, situ a work situation where that's the case, where they're probably going to get excluded from being considered just because of the degree or lack of degree? I think that it's a, it's a serious challenge if you're going for uh, a mainstream, uh, a, a, a job with a medium to large size company. And you know that's one of the big useful nature, uh, aspects of the four-year degree is that it's a signal. And so there are two ways to do it. And the way that I really advocate in the book is, uh, is not to go through the front door, which is way number one, but to go through the, the back door, so to speak, to get a referral uh, based upon your demonstrated work and skill and experience in the field. And internal referrals in companies are you know, the biggest non-traditional way that people get hired. And essentially, it's, it's just getting an employee who's currently working there to tell their manager, tell the HR department, check out this guy, check out this girl, check out their portfolio online. They've done stuff that's totally relevant to, to our company. And they don't have a degree, but again, look at this work. It's, it stands for itself. And if you are trying to push your way through the HR department, 
uh, without a college degree that you, you know, there is a chance that you'll never get your work seen. And so, of course, the first step in all of this is just having good work that is relevant to the job you're seeking in the first place. Without that, you're not going to get hired with or without a degree. But uh, I think the referral is, it's a way that I've seen lots of self-directed learners uh, get their first or second jobs. And, and then from that point, you've got the previous experience, which, as I'm sure we all know, uh, becomes much more important as you go up the, the career ladder. Um, and the college degree uh, wanes in its importance in terms of getting your foot in the door. And you make two other points, I think, related to this. One is that there are professions for which you just say, if I want to be a doctor or a lawyer, this is the path and I need to follow that path, right? Yeah, because there are licensing requirements that are essentially tied to college degree programs. Uh, so that's more for, you know, want to become a public school teacher, an architect, a doctor, a nurse. And also for, you know, if you do want to become a professor, some sort of um, person who works in college, you probably need a college degree. And the uh, research science uh, professions are, you know, they essentially live in universities. So people who are really passionate about the hard sciences, um, then it's a natural place to go, even though you don't need a license, you know, to, to practice. Uh, biology, but you, you probably need a degree from a good university. And you also talk about the value of entrepreneurism, right? That uh, even if you don't think of traditional careers as being entrepreneurial, in many ways they have become enormously um, dependent on your entrepreneurial skills to move forward in those in those careers. Yes, and I think this is an easy takeaway lesson for a lot of people who have been struggling to find a job or just more work in the recession, which is everyone has to be an entrepreneur. And again, that's not a new idea, but it's, it's something that easily gets lost when we think about how we can spend uh, ages 18 to 22. I argue in the book that when you write a sociology paper in college, the number of people who it benefits, well, it's a question, questionable that it's greater than zero. But the number of people who look at it are you, maybe a graduate assistant, and maybe the professor. And uh, instead, for those four years, or five years, more like it, you could be working on projects that don't only get seen by two sets of eyes, but get seen by larger sets of eyes by creating value for other people. That's the basic nature of, of entrepreneurialism. And so, yeah, ingraining that ethic into all of the learning projects that you do, not just uh, you know, doing stuff only for yourself, which is what I consider kind of classic self-directed learning. It's, it's what we are all born with. It's why we go learn how to play chess or dig up grubs in the yard. Uh, but upgrading that to self-directed learning 2.0, where you are doing things that interest you, but you are also creating value for other people. You are fulfilling other people's needs. And I think if you, if any young person builds that into their life from an early point, then then you will not fail in terms of finding uh, meaningful and, and well compensated work, whether you do it as an employee, as a freelancer, by starting your own gig. So Peggy also uh, asked a question here earlier about um, what about those for whom they can't afford college? Is this a good way to kind of look at what they should do instead? And I went to your uh, zero tuition college uh, network site, and if somebody wants to put a link in the chat, that would be great. Otherwise, I'll pull it up when I pause. Um, and one of the first links I clicked on was a gal who said that she was there because she didn't have the money to go to college. And I, and I want to use that as an entree to uh, a second set of traps. Right? The first set was maybe this educational trap, this trap that you need to go through the traditional route in order to get um, the skills or the career that you want. Uh, I want to discuss a second trap that you touch on, but it feels to me as sort of a really a deeply interesting uh, cultural one. And that's the trap of being sort of immediately in a position where you can't do what you want to do because you have debt to service. How, how big a deal do you think that is? I think it's huge. I, I know people, and I'm sure a lot of us know people who at age 22, they finish college with a BA or BS. And at that point, you feel like you've, you've done everything right. You've finished K through 12. You've finished college. You've finished all the mandatory stuff. At that point, graduate school, that's more, that's more optional. 
And so you've done it all, and so the world should be your oyster at that moment. But if you are locked into, uh, you know, the average is 25000 but for a lot, it's, you know, for many people, it's $100,000 in student loan debt. You've got that six-month grace period for repayment, and then you've got payments between 200 to $700 a month that, you know, are going to carry with you for decades. And so I see student loan debt as really closing a lot of the doors that we imagine college to be opening. And I, you know, debt by in and of itself is not um, not a bad thing, but debt that we take on uh, blindly, with, with hardly with even thinking about it or uh, considering how we'll repay it, and considering uh, the trade-offs, what we'll have to forsake in order to repay that debt and the interest. Uh, I think we can all agree that's that's uh, not a good thing to do, and that's what we do with 18-year-olds. We we sign them up for these the, the amount of debt that we would never dream of putting on our credit cards, um, and uh, unlike a, a house, for example, you know, a mortgage, which can be resold to the bank, hopefully for near its original price, this debt just goes straight into our brains, and we cannot resell that information back into the the colleges. And <laughs> you can't escape student loan debt. You know, you either have to flee the country or die. Essentially, <laughs> it's terrible. Well, I, so I want to propose something. And again, I mean, it may sound a little radical, but it, you know, it feels to me as though our financial and political institutions uh, almost see that as a benefit. Meaning, there's nobody out there spending lobbying money to help us be frugal and independent and self, um, um, self-sustaining, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a degree to which the current economic system kind of wants you to be trapped like that. Is, am I going way too deep there? I don't want to get into any conspiracy theory stuff, but I definitely think it's a, it's a place where there's a lot of money to be made from a lot of assumptions. And the assumption is, you have to go to college to be successful. And that's, that's a cash cow if I've ever seen one right there. Uh, so, you know, easy, e easy federal student aid, that's another really tricky thing because it's, it's a very noble goal on one side, but on the other side, if it locks people into uh, this lo student loans, which they, they could have done just as fine without, then that's, that's a bad thing too. So um, I'll, I'll leave that up to you, Steve. Yeah, I don't think you have to go to conspiracy theories to see where an existing structure benefits companies and they're not going to, you know, spend lobbying dollars to change it. Meaning, you know, nobody's going to go out there and fight for us to be self-sufficient and independent and frugal because it's not in the financial interest of anybody who's spending lobbying money. So I think, uh, you know, that kind of relates also to this idea of, and, and these are my words, not yours, but you know the ability to be independent and to be frugal uh, give you an independence of thought and thinking, which allow you to question and to participate actively in uh, political or economic discussions. And I worry that um, you know, you know part of the indebtedness of this current uh, period of time is the, one of the consequences of that is that it makes it harder for you know sort of real discussion to take place. I'm not going to expect you to respond, but I'll let you if you want to. <laughs> I, I think I agree with you. And I think when you've got serious loans to pay back, and you will not be able to spend time doing, I said, doing the stuff that you can only really do when you are a young adult, which is, for me, personally, a big one is traveling the world. Um, starting small businesses without worrying too much about whether they're going to succeed or fail doing basic self-directed learning stuff like reading lots of good books or writing for the pleasure of it. And uh, those experiences, yes, you can get some of those you know, in college. That's why, why some people do it, and some people make good use of it by doing study abroad, doing independent study. But the, the, the loans are just a uh, killer. And, and so you, you go into a traditional job, a traditional uh, at least decently paying job as quickly as you can, and that can foreclose on that on that further lifelong learning uh, possibility that you have when you are out of debt. 
I notice that one of your goals is to own a home outright. Yeah, I, I think that's lots of people's goal. <laughs> okay, so there's a question in the chat. Uh, can Could a student attend a less expensive college and also self-direct their learning? Is there a hybrid model? Well, there's no hybrid model that you're going to you know, sign up for. There's no program. But yes, that's that's you're, you're just talking about self-directed learning at that point. And I like to emphasize, especially when I'm talking about unschooling, which is the you know K through 12 uh, self-directed learning, it's technically homeschooling, but we call it unschooling. When I get into discussions about that with people, I like to emphasize that unschooling is not unstructured learning. It's not isolated learning. I know lots of unschoolers who sign up for uh, part-time community college classes or take classes online or work with you know, a coach or a mentor on something that's very, very structured. And so in the same vein, I think somebody who goes about college intelligently can look for a college that does match uh, their interests and, and their goals and it's a very inexpensive college and then while they're there, it's it's not, oh, I'm doing everything the college wants me to do. It's there and I'm I'm getting my education and this college is helping with certain aspects of it. The ones that I think it can provide a good it can provide a a good part of my education for a decent price. And then I'm going other places for other parts of my education. And so that hybrid model is the self directed learning model. Okay, so Rachel uh, asks a question which I think you answered earlier on in the interview, but she's she says she's a high school student. She's looking at various colleges. What she's hearing seems to be discouraging colleges. Uh, are you saying that, it that it's ultimately a mistake to take that path? I don't think you are, but certainly there are a number of fears that arise when people think about um, being this independent in their decision making, right? Yeah, Rachel, I say you have probably been looking at colleges and been thinking about colleges for a long time now, probably probably not just recently, because it's just such part of our, our culture and it's such an expectation. And so I'd say in addition to looking at various colleges, different prices, different majors, et cetera, that's good research to do because you might find one that really matches you. Uh, in addition to that, do the research into what the alternatives to college are and just ask what are other really cool, interesting, productive, adventurous things I could be doing from age 18 to 22 instead of going to college. And then if you find some good answers there too, consider that, again, that, that hybrid model. How do you combine the two? And for a lot of people, that looks like a gap year. So they'll take that, you know, at age 18 to, to take it off. And if you apply to the colleges that you're really into, you get into them, and then you defer your admission for one year, you can take a gap year with no risk of then not getting into college later. And I think that's a great path for people who who are interested in both alternatives to college and they know they definitely do want to go to college. So, there you go. Rhonda makes a connection that I wanted to make later in the interview, but I'm glad to do so now. She says, self-directed learning is typically the root of entrepreneurship, in her opinion. Um, I, I feel like the book really makes that connection, that the kind of skills of the self-directed learner naturally lead to the kinds of skills that um, are, are part of the entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah, I define uh, higher education, having a higher education in my book as having the capacity to do self-directed learning. And that is very much tied into entrepreneurship because I, to me, if you have a higher education, you can deal with a complex problem. You can find a novel solution to a complex problem. That might be uh, starting a business because starting a business is one of those classic things where nobody it's going to give you a blueprint, or if they tell you they have a blueprint, they're selling you snake oil. Uh, but that also looks like, uh, you know, solving, you know, global warming issues. It also looks like addressing poverty in a city. There are some really hairy problems out there that we're running into, and it requires self-directed learning and entrepreneurs, whether or not they have college degrees. So I want to go back to the fear question which is, what are some of the common fears that people express to you about uh, thinking this independently about their college career? So the number one fear is that they'll become directionless and unproductive 
And that's what I try to address in the book in the structure and accountability section. I, I think a large part of what we pay for through the college experience is the structure and the, uh, the expectation from your peers and from professors and teaching assistants and perhaps a counselor, uh, the expectations that you're going to follow through on this challenging four-year course of um, study, and they're going to assist you along the way when you struggle. And so when you don't go through an institution and you're not paying tens of thousands of dollars a year, you have to find and create that structure and that sense of accountability for yourself. You need to recruit your own mentors and your own coaches. And so that, I explain how to do that in the book, and the Zero Tuition College website is just one little way that I, I attempted to start stoking the fire of having people connect with their own mentors uh, for free, you know, using the internet as a, as a matchmaker. And the website stick.com, which is stick with two Ks, and I think that that website offers a great peek into just the basic principles of accountability uh, as if you're going to be doing it on your own. And, and so just to briefly relay what that website does, you, you sign up, you write a goal that you want to do. They make sure it's a specific goal and it has to happen within a certain amount of time. And then they say you need to elect a referee for this goal, and that's someone who can monitor your progress. So typically choose a friend or a family member. And then you need to put down money on the goal. You actually give them your credit card information or your PayPal address. And then you get to choose where the money goes if your goal is not completed when you say you're going to complete it, as defined by the referee. And so you can say that the goal goes to a certain person, excuse me, the money that you put down goes to a certain person, um, or the money can go to a charity, so a cause you support, or my favorite one is it can go to an anti-charity. And so let's say you set the goal of reading whatever, you know, 10 classic books in the next six months, and your referee says, oh, you didn't do it. And so they go onto the STIC website, and STIC asks them, did you do this goal? And the referee says, no. And the, let's say the $100 that you put down on that suddenly goes to a charity whose, whose cause you, you totally despise. And so it doesn't have to be that extreme, you know, putting down money on every little thing you say you're going to do for your self-directed education. But I think that really demonstrates the basic principles of accountability and, and how you can hold yourself accountable to what you say you're going to do without a very expensive college uh, institutional structure. One of the great points for me that I took away from the book, sort of the, one of the huge ahas was, and I, and I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, but I think you say this, which is when you get out of college, you're going to have to have those skills, right? So it's not like by going to college, you don't have to learn accountability and self-direction. They're going to be required in the jobs that you take. So if you uh, are avoiding learning those skills by going to college and depending on them, you're not really helping yourself in the long run. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think the, the social networking aspect, a lot of people do want to go to college for the social networking aspect. And I say in the book, listen, when you graduate from college, you're going to have to start making your own friends and forming your own connections, uh, just like <laughs> just like you would do if you were 18 and you didn't go to college. And in the same way, you have to act like an entrepreneur after you graduate college in the same way you would have to at age 18. And so that's why you know, the idea of challenging the, the conventional wisdom and taking an alternative path to college is intimidating because you are undertaking challenges that a lot of people put off until well into their 20s at an earlier age. But uh, I don't think that should... Uh, that should stop anyone, especially when this is something we've discussed so little. It is very easy to go to college uh, as it, at age 19, 20, 21, to, to start as a freshman there. Yes, you'll be slightly older than your cohort, but if that's the, your biggest concern, you know, if, if that's what's holding you back from trying uh, some very interesting self-work learning projects first, and then if it doesn't work out and you feel like it's just really too structureless and the social networking is very, you know, much too difficult for you, then you can go back to college. So Mike asked the question about being two years into school is at UC Davis and, uh, you know, what are his options at this point? Mikey, I'm going to refer you to, the, if, you, if you get the free Kindle chapters, I think uh, Blake's story is in there. He's also told at the beginning of this interview and you can 
listen to the recording. Or maybe even email Blake and see if he'll send you a copy of the book. But that's about kind of where Blake was when he had to make some decisions, right? And, and, and I'd actually love to, to chime in on that just because I, I know Mike personally from a summer camp where we work. So thanks for listening, Mike. And I, I'd say there is actually an additional challenge in uh, already being thigh deep into college because uh, dropping out with debt uh, but without the, the potentially useful bachelor's degree as, as an economic signal is a, is a hairier position to be in than it is if you just never went to college at all and didn't have the debt. And so it, it's, it, it is a, a toss-up. I'd say you, could, you can double down, finish school, and uh, you know, graduate with the debt, hope for the best. But I think what you'll pull from my story in the book is uh, you can maximize your self-directed learning experience in college. If, if you're already there or you already know you're going or just your, your parental expectation is, is so high that there's, you know, if you didn't go to college, your family would disown you. Um, maximize the, the opportunities for a study abroad, for doing independent study, for designing your own major if you're not in love with every single course that's currently in your major track. I actually explain a lot of those options in the back of my first book, which is College Without High School, which is where I explain how to get into a good college without a traditional high school background. And Mikey, my brother is a professor at UC Davis, so <laughs> go bend his ear, and uh, depending on what you're studying, he's in the business school there. Um, okay, so you have a quote in the book that also was a great takeaway for me, one that I had not read before. Uh, from Abraham Maslow, you will either step forward into growth or you will step back into safety. So there's this fear that takes place before kind of making the decision to become a self-directed learner. But it feels like afterwards there's all, there are also fears that can come up, right? Like, um, who am I to blog? Uh, you know, who, who's going to be interested in what I have to do? What kind of advice do you give to people to help overcome those fears that after they've made the decision to be self-directed? It's hard to give advice in, in that situation. It's the same way where you say, how do you give advice to your friend who's in a dead-end job, but they don't want to leave it because of the feeling of, of lack of security? And you can say, you know, it's going to be fine on the other side. You can, you can make your own way. But, uh, you know, that, I, th I just want to say that's a tricky question. And for me, in, in terms of the, the doubt about, like, oh, who am I to start writing a blog, which is you know, a classic way to start producing value with your writing instead of just writing for yourself like you would with a journal. Uh, I'd say you don't have to make your, your work or your, um, your goals totally public in the beginning because that, that is a scary thing. You can just start with writing a blog that you have a couple of close friends um, look at each week. And it's the same way. I'm not sure how you started the podcast, but I'm sure it was these little baby steps. And to think that you're going to jump from being a novice writer into an internet stardom is, of course, uh, a ridiculous expectation. And so a lot of the, the self-directed learners uh, who, who I work with start with very small operations. And just like anyone else who's starting a blog, starting a podcast, starting a business, uh, it's just step by step slightly increasing your envelope at each step as you build your skills. So I'm going to take us to what I feel like is um, maybe one of the most important messages of the book uh, and, and maybe serves as a kind of an on-ramp to um, the, this last question of uh, feeling comfortable with what you're doing. And that is the uh, sort of phenomenally valuable advice you give around giving that the best way to market yourself or get started on things is to give of your time or energy to somebody else as a part of learning and as a part of kind of creating value. Yeah, that touches on that, again, the invaluable opportunities that are available to almost exclusively the young adults, which includes volunteering your time, uh, working as an intern or an apprentice, and taking time to uh, experiment with producing things like, again, let's say, use a blog as an example, um, that uh, you know, maybe you don't quite have the skills to make uh, a really valuable blog for, for other people, but you can give your time and give your energy and build your skills through trial and error, which is not something that uh, you know, becomes easier 
later in life. We need a, a little bit more guarantee as we, we get older. And so, uh, especially for those, you know, I, I do the thought experiment, what would you do with $20,000 instead of going to college? Especially for those who have nowhere near $20,000 to spend on higher education, maybe it's closer to zero. Uh, volunteering, interning, apprenticing, and um, and any other ways that you can give your work away for free or near free in exchange for experience is the the classic way that self-directed learning takes place. That's how it's done for hundreds of years. I'm going to disagree with you. I don't think this is just a, a young adult uh, principle. I think for those of us who've participated in the web and in a lot of the social media efforts, especially in the education world, we're living the same principle. You know, this interview series, while it's had some sponsorship, you know, it's largely a gift I give to the community that pays itself back in a lot of other ways. Um, speaking engagements or opportunities to participate in uh, consulting and the like. And actually, I, I think it's a bigger principle. I think it's a, a lifelong principle of the importance of finding ways to give and to give value. I completely agree, and it's one of the motivations for me to, to give my book away as a PDF to teenagers and college students because, uh, yeah, there's so many inta intangible values that come from uh, just spreading your idea, spreading your message, or if you want to look at it from a business standpoint, spreading your brand. And to, uh, you know, I do take a very, like, focus on ROI, you know, aspect on the book when we're breaking down the costs of college. But at the same time, there's there's you know a big argument like you're making for not considering money that you get in return if you are doing something that you love, that interests you. And it does pr provide some sort of modicum of value for other people. Uh, yeah, you will get a return on your investment in many non-monetary ways. And again, that's, the, that's a serious entrepreneurship ethic. And if my book achieves nothing else, I hope that just a few more young people start thinking like entrepreneurs, uh, start focusing on, on producing stuff of value for other people, and you know, when they can't sell it, giving it away. We've talked about this on the show before, and it actually came up on my podcast with Audrey about her son, which was, I mean, if you're not going to be doing anything else, go to somebody who's doing something you like and say that you'll, you'll volunteer to work for them for free for two weeks. Um, if nothing else, you'll learn. But the great likelihood is you'll actually an opportunity will come up because of that. Uh, this to me was a great part of the book, and I um, I don't know how to draw any more attention to it. Uh, one thing you said was always be the person giving more, and I think that's really good advice, uh, regardless of age. Um, and then you create a connection between uh, moving past self-directed learning to self-directed learning 2.0, which was self-directed learning toward the needs of others. And I thought that was really a valuable um, kind of distinction or um, advance or improvement uh, in terms of thinking about self-directed learning. Yeah, and, and again, that came out of my work with, with homeschoolers and unschoolers. And uh, that's what I essentially see as the transition from uh, being a child to being an adult. And in the context of, let's say, unschoolers, they, they're focusing on their own learning uh, their own projects, you know, for a great length of time, usually when you're living with their parents. And then, you know, to flourish in a market society, you do need to create uh, something that other people value. You stop thinking pr primarily about yourself and you start thinking about uh, the needs of others. And if you can combine that with what's important and valuable to you, then that's that's the golden ticket right there. That's self directed learning 2.0. And I think that's the the, the goal for a lot of people, whether they're entrepreneurs or employees, is to find that, that, that magic spot where your, your interests and values overlap with uh, a market need. Peggy, who's one of my heroes, a retired uh, school principal, is wondering if you might consider giving away your book for free to adult learners. <laughs> well, Peggy, I'll let you, let you know a little secret. I, I don't have a, a, a magic machine for <laughs> separating actual teenagers and college students from everyone else. So if you go on the website, you might be able to, you just might be able to get a copy for yourself. So <laughs> go for it. Okay, uh, you know, we're, we're, I want to leave a little bit of time here for q and I did want to make sure that we touched a little bit on the um, 
both finding support and the representation of yourself online or the personal portfolio piece. Um, you know, a lot of people hesitate to represent themselves online. They feel like in some ways it's egotistical or they're nervous about putting something up. What advice do you give on uh, related to the importance of having some kind of portfolio? I think anyone, college student or not, who does not have some sort of um, online presence is really missing out, uh, especially for anyone who you know, wants to work in a creative field. Um, and so I, I recommend creating an online portfolio, which can be done so easily for those who are not tech savvy or not website design savvy today. There are beautiful templates out there waiting for you on WordPress or on Squarespace. And you pay 15 bucks to register your domain name for a year and then load up that portfolio with, you know, it depends upon which, what your goals are. If you want to uh, promote yourself as a blogger, that's a much different thing from promoting your local uh, you know, home repair business or from uh, you know, working in food service, for example. Uh, but putting in essentially your, your relevant work in as much multimedia uh, format as possible, as many photos and movies and uh, links to uh, what I call deliverables as possible. And then along with the sort of hard evidence of, of your background and your experience, uh, it's kind of like the, the college admissions essay, but for, for you personally, for your life, it's, it's the bio, the, the story, the about me page, where you have the chance to explain your non-traditional path if you didn't finish college. And I think having a good, essentially two or three paragraph elevator pitch where you describe uh, what you did and why you did it instead of going to college. You said, I had the option. You, you said, at age 18, let's say I applied and got into a few colleges, and I was thinking I was wavering, and then I decided against it because I wanted to take a gap year, and I thought travel and work and doing some personal studies would be uh, a lot better use of my time. And then at age 19, I extended it for another year, and then I sort of never looked back and I got involved with this really cool company and I started this project on the side that blossomed into something else. I started these projects over on this side and they just failed miserably, but here's what I learned from them. If you can weave your own, uh, your own tale in that way, I think that, man, talk about a signal, an economic signal. That is just pure gold in terms of uh, showing that you are uh, a creative person who can handle big complex problems. The biggest problem, of course, being your own life. And uh, that, in addition to the hard skills, the demonstrated hard skills, which of course you need to have when we're talking about getting hired or doing freelance work, that's how I see the, you know, the online presence of, of a self-directed learner We're easily translating into all sorts of opportunities, both monetary and non-monetary. You haven't heard, but we've told the story on the show. I have one daughter who got into college because of her blog. The one who went to Nepal got into the college of her choice, where she was originally turned down, but going through a review process was able to send her blog to them. Uh, and then I have another daughter who just got a grant to do to build theater programs for students with autism, uh, and also has a strong web presence. I'm, I'm a huge believer in this, and I'm interested that when I talk to teachers, they will often agree that students need a personal digital web presence or a profile, but they're very uh, awkward about creating their own. And I tell them, you, you know, this is a, you know, this if you want to both, both for your own sake and for modeling it for students, it's a great practice. Hey, I see that Kevin C here is the co-producer of the Ultimate History Lesson, which is an incredible resource. Uh, we can with John Taylor Gatto, and he wanted you to know also, it scrolled up in the chat, Blake, that he was with uh, John Taylor Gatto last week, and he was reading your book and making lots of notes in it, and was recommending it highly. I saw that. It's very heartwarming. <laughs> That's terrific. No, no bigger compliment. Okay, so uh, if I've missed the question, I hope you'll put it in the chat. I've tried to address them as we've gone along, but uh, please feel free to post an old or a new question, uh, or you can raise your hand to ask Blake a question. The hand uh, raising icon is the third one over in the participant window. If you raise your hand, I can give you the microphone and you can ask a question. Um, while we're waiting for a question to come in, you do sort of publicly note your failures on your life goals set page on your site. Um, what's the what's the importance of failure or recognizing failure? 
I think it's you know it's a terrible handicap to be to be afraid of failure. It means you'll never try anything awesome. <laughs> so I, I picked that up. I, I think I was really influenced by Tina Seelig of Stanford University, who runs the the D School over there, and her lectures and videos on creativity are are awesome. And, and I remember reading about the failure resume that she had her students uh, produce. You know, it's instead of your successes, it's everything you you, you fail that terribly. And I, I just love that idea. So I, I sold that idea and promoted myself. Now. There's a place in the book where you kind of tell your story, and then you tell the pieces of the story that don't normally make it into the story, you know, the, the experiences that weren't so great. I, I really love that. Pablo, I've given you microphone privileges, but I can see that you've got a little bit of a bandwidth issue. We'll give it a try. Click on the talk button at the top left, and let's see if we can hear you. And it looks like he dropped off. Um, okay, uh, maybe a time for one or two more questions. Please feel free to put one in the chat or to raise your hand. Um, do you want to talk at all about uh, finding support and maybe your online community? Yes, I think that mentors play a big role in any uh, self-directed learner's success or lack thereof. And I think there's a role for two different types of mentors. Um, let's just talk about in the higher education realm. The first one is the, the subject-specific mentor, which is, oh, I want to learn a lot about archaeology, obviously. Find someone who has an archaeology background. That's pretty straightforward. And more importantly, what I created the Zero Tuition College website for is more general mentors, something more akin to a college guidance counselor, but like an uncollege guidance counselor. And this is someone who can help you essentially create a nice balance of uh, activities in your life in the same way that a guidance counselor might say, I see you're taking a lot of classes in this department, consider taking these, or this professor is really good. And, this, and, and so a, a wide focus mentor, I think, especially one who's not um, a parent who you have a deep pre-existing relationship with, um, can be very valuable, and, and that might make or break your success as a self-directed learner. The reason I say probably not a parent is because parents are very good at giving the positive reinforcing feedback that we all love and need, but it, I think it's more difficult for a parent to give the more critical or changing feedback that we don't love but do need because they have an invested interest in you know, preserving a harmonious relationship with their son or daughter. And so finding a, a third-party mentor who can help point you in the right direction, somebody who is experienced with uh, self-directed learning, and, um, and who can get, you know, throw the hard punches when they realize that you're, you're slacking off or you're not following through on the goals you had before. Again, you've got that accountability need that comes in there. Uh, I, I think that's a, a big pillar of support for doing something like Zero Tuition College. So Blake, after Classroom 2.0, which now has over 70,000 members, I started something called Student 2.0, which was intended to do the same thing, but I I'd never really caught hold. Do you have a sense that maybe we're still a little early for this kind of community? I do. Uh, I do think we're a little early, and it's, it's something that's really catching fire with the parents. That's my... Uh, you know, those are the people who are largely reading my book are the parents, and I like to write my book directly to the, the audience who, you know, is kind of in, in the thick of it. So I write for the 18 to 20 something year olds. But, uh, I, yeah, yeah, it is a little, little disappointing in, in how, <laughs> how many of the, uh, the 18 to 20, 20 something year olds are the ones actually participating in all this. And, you know, it's, it's an intimidating, it's a scary thing to, to really think about serious alternatives to the mainstream path. And I don't think that that will change for a while. It's, it's, a, it's an uphill battle with that ahead of us. Blake, thank you so much. As a courtesy to our guests, we do finish on time. I'm clapping for you to find the darn hidden clapping applause icon. You hover over the smiley face and then click on applause. Blake, that was really fun. I love the book. Love love now knowing you. and appreciate your taking the time to 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 talk about the book with us. Thanks a lot for having me, Steve. This is great.
It was great. Most appreciated. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. The recording will be posted later tonight, both in MP3 format and in the full Blackboard Collaborate form. And uh, stay tuned. Next week, Denise Pope from Stanford and Kirsten Olson on her book, Wounded by School. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day or night, depending on where you are. Bye now. <laughs>